So I wanted to see if there were any questions from the audience. Um, so I don't know if, if anyone has a question. We'll take maybe two or three from the, from the audience. All right, so Joe Salas, you have a question for us. Is the supremacy of the Arabic language an impediment to making Islam relevant in America? All right, is the, say that again, is the? Supremacy of the Arabic language, having to know it, having to converse in it. I mean, we all don't need to be scholars going to study the original text. Just for average day Muslims, having that as a need to study Arabic or to learn Arabic to make it relevant in America. So how much, is a how much of a barrier is the Arabic language to really developing a, a solid foundation in Islamic studies and being a leader and making Islam, you know, not only practicing it, but, but serving the community. How much is Arabic language uh, um, uh, a potential barrier if you don't have that? Is that what you're asking? Is that, uh, yeah. You want to handle this one? Uh? Well, just my own reflection on the, that question. I'm a convert to Islam. It took me maybe three days to learn Al-Fatiha in Arabic. Three days. And learning what those Arabic words meant opened up so much meaning for me. So, no, I don't think Arabic actually is an impediment at all. It's, it's another door of understanding. What the Catholic seminary did, what the Jewish seminary did, is basically provide the means by which a student can access the text. Of course, if you want to be a New Testament scholar, you have to study what? Hebrew. No, Greek. Oh, Greek New Testament. Yeah, the Old Testament and the Torah, you got to study Hebrew. Well, I'm sorry. If you're going to be a student of Islam, you got to know Arabic. I'm sorry, because that's the text. To get into the meat of it, just like if you want to study French literature. If you want to study whatever literature, Russian literature, you don't study a translation. You have to get into the Russian text to really get into it. Does it take time? Yes, it takes time. But that is simply you know, our task before us. And so what the seminaries did was provide students the ability to live in both word, worlds. They had their English, but also they were trained to access the text and to help translate the text, not literally just translate the words, but translate the, the meaning, the deep meaning that is found in the text to an English language uh, audience. Could I riff off that for a second? Because, and, and as speaking as a, more of a, in my academic training as a sociologist, I have no pretense about any uh, uh, scholarship in Islam. But I think the way you framed your question was interesting because you talked about the supremacy of the Arabic language. And, you know, cultural anthropologists, obviously one of their first engagements with conversations about culture is linguistics. And so I take absolutely, you know, what Dr. Ahsan says, you know, uh, is uh, no exception to that. That's solid. But I think you would also agree that the problem comes into play when language gets associated with broader cultural supremacy, right? And linguistic frameworks begin to inhibit the way people communicate to one another, right? And they begin to kind of develop these, you know, oftentimes very contrived constructs to be able to communicate and talk to others about Islam, you know, deploying, uh, ling you know, all the right citations of ahadith and ayat and, you know, the, and oftentimes that gets into the way, and I do think that has, in some cases, then renders the community less relevant, less able to be able to more naturally, organically connect to other communities, not to mention some of the more uh, larger issues about you know, culture and race and, and, and intra-community dynamics about uh, notions. I mean, Dr. Jackson and others, of course, have talked about the problems of placing uh, not just linguistic supremacy, but then, you know, uh, placing the supremacy of understanding and interpreting Islam through those who don't have a intellectual organic basis here. But I, and I think that's why the Bayan project is so, is so important, you know. Just one, one footnote to that, I agree with you. 
it's, it's not so much the supremacy of Arab, Arabic, but the supremacy, the idea that people who come from overseas who maybe speak Arabic are superior. So poor Dr. Sherman Jackson, who speaks fluent Arabic, he tells me, you know, every now and then, you know, people, you know, act like he's just a new Muslim, yeah. doesn't know anything, yeah. right? So, and he speaks fluent Arabic. So it's not the Arabic, but it's the idea that people from overseas and their command of the Arabic and Islam is superior to our understanding. And that's what's going to have to change. And it will, it I will see all change. the Arabs in the room nodding their head. Yeah, that's us. That's us. <laughs> uh, uh, can I ask something? Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm coming from Turkey, originally from Turkey. So, uh, you know, only I can think a wild estimates, 2% uh, of Turkish society speaks Arabic uh, and understands it. You know, when they read the Quran, they don't understand it really. You just read it as a sacred text. They still connect to the text in, you know, in very different ways. In, sometimes in, in deeper ways, one can in more profound ways uh, than people who did do speak and understand the Quran when they read it. So that's, there's also that possibility. Uh, and also uh, we can say, I mean, the Turkish society is also a religious society. They connected, uh, they connected themselves to Islam uh, for almost now 1,000 years without really having a mastery of that language. So you can say the same thing, you know, in India, Indonesia, Malaysia, places like that. So Islam is still relevant without uh, Arabic. I'm not, you know, here, you know, one cannot deny the importance of Arabic in the study of religion, in study of Islam. Uh, that's a must, especially if you're a scholar, uh, you want to be you know, serious about this issue. But when it comes to the reality of religion in the society, uh, that is a secondary question now. Now we should find ways to express, to make Islam relevant in English too. And uh, I can safely say that English reached a level now, especially uh, in the 20th century, after all those studies being done you know, in Islamic studies, right? And written, uh, books written about Islam, now it's, it's, I believe it's, it's English reached that level to express uh, profundity of Islamic intellectuality and you know, spirituality. So it can be used as a tool to, you know, to convey uh, that depth. All right, excellent. So that was a really good question. You got three of our panelists to, to weigh in on that and, and, and Dr. Bagby even more than once. So that was, that was a great question. Next question has to be even better.